How about now? It's been a technological nightmare this morning. My tablet wants to quit. My microphone quit in first service. I almost quit. <laughs> but I didn't. You're stuck with me. So here we go. Hey, I'm glad you're here. My name is George Gasperson. I'm the pastor here at Christ Community. And if you happen to be here for the very first time, we just want to tell you how glad we are that you're here. Thank you for coming, and we hope that you come again. We are talking about the life of David these days. And as my granddaughter says this morning, I got some splaining to do. Because in our story this morning, we're going to see God do something so unexpected, so surprising that it, it has a, a way of coming across as almost unfair. Generally speaking, there are two kinds of people in the world. They, the first kind is the kind of person that I call the laid back, easygoing, free spirited folks. You may be one of them. Hey, you just kind of lay back and whatever comes, comes. You just look for the easiest way to get things done. Like that Staples commercial, you hit the easy button and life just goes right on. And then there are the detail people. Us free spirits have names for people who are stuck on detail. Obsessed. Sticklers for details, most of the time, though, we just call you weirdos. <laughs> Maybe you're married to one of these people. See, for detail people, there's a place for everything, and everything has to be in its place. Detail people, when they're on a pastoral staff at a church, something like this, <laughs> might even stock the staff uh, soft drink refrigerators with cans of soda and make it to where all of the labels are turned exactly the same way in the same direction on all the shelves. Or you could ask a detailed person for a simple piece of information and you get a multiple page presentation in return complete with spreadsheets and a PowerPoint presentation. Free spirits like to make fun of detailed people. But today we'll see that paying attention to details is a big deal to God. In fact, I'm calling today's message, The Little Things. And we're going to be talking from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, if you want to find your way there. While you're going there, let me set the stage for our story today. The setting is the city of Jerusalem, and David is now the king. Saul is dead. And he's gone. But the destructive results of his life still echo throughout the land. And as our story begins, King David is unhappy. He's unhappy because the Ark of the Covenant, the most important piece of worship furniture in all of Judaism, is not in Jerusalem. Years ago, it was stolen by the Philistines. And now it sits in a man's house, miles away from the city, David wants to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. Now, in order to understand the details of today's lesson, there are some details that we need to understand about the ark. And when I say the ark of the covenant, I don't want you to think of a big ship like Noah's ark. In fact, here is a picture of a reproduction of the ark of the covenant. The ark was a rectangular box made out of wood, gold-plated on the inside and the outside. It had a decorative, ornate border all around. On top of the ark was a grate, a see-through cover made of pure gold called the mercy seat. And on top of that cover were two cherubim, two angels who were, had their, their wings spread across the top of the covering. Inside the ark were three objects. 
First was a golden jar containing some of the manna that God had supplied the Israelites when they were wandering through the desert. Second, Aaron's rod was inside the ark. And third were the two stone tablets that God gave Moses on top of Mount Sinai. The Ark of the Covenant was absolutely holy, so holy that God insisted that it be moved or carried in a very specific way. At each of the four corners of the Ark were small golden ringlets. Do you see them? And through those ringlets would pass gold-plated poles by which the entire ark was to be carried. No human ever, ever, ever touched the ark. It was so holy. Instead, it was moved and transported only by the Levites, the priests, who were to put those poles onto their shoulders and carry the ark that way. This ark was so important because it was the physical place where God himself dwelled among the people. This seems funny to us living today because we live now in a time where God's presence is inside all of us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't so back then. Wherever the ark was placed, that's where God's glory rested. And wherever the ark was, was the holiest place on earth. David wanted the ark back in Jerusalem, in the tabernacle, because that was his rightful place. See, David had a heart after God's, even to the degree that he would go and find and retrieve a small piece of furniture to put in its rightful place. So, in today's story, David retrieves the Ark of the Covenant. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all. He led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the Ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. They placed the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio, Abinadab's sons, were guiding the cart that carried the Ark of God. Ahio walked in front of the Ark. David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs, playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and symbols. Try to imagine the joy and the celebration that was taking place because the ark was finally coming home. 30,000 at least, and no telling how many more, were singing and playing with David, the man after God's own heart, leading the way. And so here they come, down the hill from Abinadab's house with the ark on the cart, and that's when something terrible happens. Verses 6 and 7. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah reached out his hand and steadied the ark of God. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him dead because of this. So Uzzah died right there beside the ark of God. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a little bit hard for me to get my head wrapped around completely. I mean, here is this poor guy, Uzzah, doing his best to see that God's ark is protected and cared for. The oxen stumble, the ark wobbles, maybe it even tips, and all this did, all this man did was because he loved God, he put his hand up and steadied the ark just to show a hands. Who would probably have done the same thing if you were there? And you'd all be dead, right? 
But guess what? I think I would probably have done the same thing as well. We would never let God's holy ark fall over on the ground, would we? But that act so angered God that Uzzah was struck dead on the spot. And David didn't appreciate it either. This is verse 8. David was angry because the Lord got angry. And his anger burst out against Uzzah. He named that place Perez Uzzah, which means to burst out against Uzzah, as it is still called today. Does this seem unfair to anybody here? I mean, if we were to dare call God, it seems unfair, doesn't it? Doesn't God appreciate the effort that Uzzah put forth on behalf of God and the ark? You might be tempted to think this is unfair, and you might be tempted to think that this is wrong. But let me tell you what's right. None of this would have happened if the ark of God had been carried properly. The ark was never supposed to be carried on a cart pulled by oxen. The Levites were the one to carry on their shoulders the ark putting the gold poles exactly through the gold ringlets. But see, David didn't do any of that. He didn't pay attention to the details. He was doing what God wanted, but he wasn't doing it God's way. Instead, he was doing what was convenient, what was easiest, and maybe even what he wanted to do. David was angry because God lashed out. But do you know who was really at fault? It was David. Because David failed to do his homework. He neglected to pay attention to the little things. And when it comes to the little things of God, the little things are important things. I think it was as if God was saying, listen, I'm sorry this happened. But if you had taken just a minute to read in my word, I laid out everything that you needed to know. I gave you the process for how this kind of thing was supposed to be done. And I wanted you to do it my way, God said, instead of your own way. Who really cares about how the ark is carried? God does. Who cares about little gold poles and four little gold ringlets? God does. If he didn't care and if it wasn't important, he wouldn't have written it down. And because God cares about those kind of details, we must care too. So now David was afraid of God, and he aborted the mission for a while. Let me tell you how the story ends up. This is verses 9 through 15. David was now afraid of the Lord, and he asked, How can I ever bring the ark of the Lord back into my care? So David decided not to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. And then King David was told, The Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because of the ark of God. See, that's the holy place now. So David went there. And he brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with a great celebration. After the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fatted calf. 
And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and the blowing of ram's horns. Something happened between these verses and the first time. And if, in fact, it took two times. The second time, the second try of moving the ark, David did something different because the ark finally came to Jerusalem. What was different about the second time than the first time? I found a parallel scripture that fills in the blanks and the details. This is from 1 Chronicles chapter 15. David prepared a place for the ark of God and set up a special tent for it. Then he commanded, no one except the Levites may carry the ark of God. The Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to serve him forever. And then David summoned all Israel to Jerusalem to bring the ark of the Lord to, place, to the place he had prepared for it. Then David summoned the priests Zadok and Abathar, and he said to them, you are the leaders of the Levite families. You must pur purify yourselves and all your fellow Levites so you can bring the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. Because you Levites did not carry the ark the first time, the anger of the Lord our God burst out against us. We failed to ask God how to move it properly. So the priests and the Levites purified themselves in order to bring the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to Jerusalem. And then the Levites carry the ark of God on their shoulders with its carrying poles, just as the Lord instructed Moses. What was the difference? between attempt number one and attempt number two, David realized the detail, the little things were important to God. The first time, David was only concerned about getting the ark back. It doesn't matter how, let's just get it back. But the second time, David got the ark back by doing it God's way. And my friends, that's the point of the message for this morning. Little things, the details are important to God. Details are a big deal to God. If you don't believe me, try reading the book of Leviticus one time. You ever read the book of Leviticus? I recommend that to you when your sleeping pill doesn't work. If we, if we took a vote of the most boring book of the Bible, Leviticus wins every time. You know why? It's 27 straight chapters of nothing but details. God's detailed instructions to priests and Levites about how to worship Him, about how to live for Him. Read Leviticus and you'll see that the little details are important to God. Or if that doesn't convince you, take a look at the first nine chapters of 2 Chronicles. Nine straight chapters of nothing but boring lists. Lists of names. Lists of people. Lists of places. Lists of genealogies. You might read this and you might think, who cares about this junk? God cares. Or he never would have written it down. So if this story is going to make any kind of difference in our life, then we've got to figure out what these little things, these details of life that are important to God look like today. 
The Bible contains principles after principle after principle, details about life change, about obedience, about how to align our will with His will. We've got to learn what these principles look like and not just gloss them over as a means to an end because God is not only concerned with getting us to place from place A to place B in our spiritual life. The process is just as important as the destination. And sometimes... We short-circuit the process just so we can get to the destination on time. Let me give you an example, just one example of what a detail looks like that is important to God, that ought to be important to us. These are Jesus' words. It's from Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower." You must give up your own way. You must take up your cross. And you must follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll just lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, that's when you will save it. If you want to become a follower, and that is Jesus' desire for every one of us, if we want to become a follower, then there are details and a process to becoming Jesus' follower. Think about this. When Jesus was alive, there must have been thousands of people that simply followed him around from one place to the next. They were just like a herd just walk around. Maybe they wanted to see just one more miracle. Maybe there was nothing good on television. So they just wanted to follow him around for some entertainment. And if you ask a majority of those people, I'll bet you they would say, yeah, I follow Jesus. There may have been hundreds who were very interested in what he had to say. They listened intently. Maybe they asked him a question or two that wasn't recorded in the scripture. They tried really hard to intellectually understand what Jesus was saying. And I'll bet if you tapped one of them on the shoulder and said, are you a follower? They would say, well, yes. But in Jesus' eyes, following behind him as he walked from place to place isn't what a follower is all about. Someone who is wrestling intellectually with the principles that he teaches isn't exactly what a follower is all about. Jesus said the details of becoming a follower mean that you give up your own way of doing life. You give up your future. Boy, those are hard words, but those are the details. And you follow me. Real followers are concerned with the little things. Many people try to follow Jesus without paying attention to the little things. They want to carry their ark on a cart because it's easier, because it's less trouble, because it's more convenient. See, there's no cost. There's no expectations. Paying attention to the little things when it comes to following Jesus is rarely the easiest way. It's rarely the quickest way. It requires extra time, extra effort, extra trouble, extra sacrifice. But if the story of David and the ark teaches us anything, it's the fact that because 
the little things are important to Jesus, they've got to be important to us too. Now let me draw this to a close by offering you a, a, a couple of observations or principles that I think are the, the main, the, the heart of this story. These are the principles that this story is designed to teach us today in 2019 in Winter Haven, Florida. First, we have got to learn what God considers to be important. We got to know the details that God says these are important to me. Think about this. Do you know why David messed up the first time? Well, yes, it's because he didn't pay attention to the details, but I don't think David knew the details. And there's a there's an application there for us. We don't, we, we have no way of following the little things to please God if we don't know the little things that he considers important. Can you think of a better reason to dig out that Bible and begin to find what God considers important? Second is this, the best test of obedience really isn't the big things. It's the little things. Little things like ringlets and poles and shoulders. So often we think, well, I've given God the big things of my life, so I guess I'm where I need to be. But what if God said, wait a minute, what about the little things too? The reason why the little things of life are so important is because the little things can be little islands of rebellion. Let me tell you what I mean. Let me give you an example. Take the, the principle of giving. God teaches that it is in his process, it's a, it's a it's important to him that followers, Christians, those who claim his name, give financially. So many people say, okay, <clears throat> I, uh, I've got some spare change, so uh, I just kind of put it in the offering plate on my way out, and next week if I have a little extra, then okay. And we walk out and we say, I am, I am pleasing God in the big thing. I am giving. But in God's word, there is also details. Words like tithing. Words like offering. Words like first fruit. And so many times, we say to ourselves, I'll give, but there's nobody going to be telling me how I'm going to give my money. So see, you're obeying God in the big, because you're giving. But in the little thing, it's still an island of rebellion. See, sometimes it's not the big things that are the litmus test of obedience. It's in the little things. And third, we find freedom in our life when we do things God's way. Sometimes God's way is so much different than what we would ever do. God might ask us to wait when everything within us screams, go forward. Or sometimes God says, sit still and wait on me. Sometimes God might ask us to carry an ark on our shoulder when there's a perfectly good new cart sitting right there. But my friends, when you do things God's way, you will find a freedom of living that you can find no other way. You don't have to worry 
about whether or not God is pleased with you. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're doing the right thing in your life. You want freedom? Learn God's way of doing things and do it that way. You will have freedom that can only come from God. God is looking for men and women with a heart after His who not only are interested in doing the big things, the obvious things, but because their heart beats like His, they realize the little things are important as well. If the little things are important to God, then they need to be important to us. And as we get ready to leave, I just wonder, are there some little things that you just realize that, yeah, I, I know that's probably God's way, but up until now, I just haven't wanted to. Maybe this story can help you understand that maybe that's the key to the freedom that you've been looking for and has been so elusive in your life. Why not look at the little things of what God feels like is important? You line your life up with them and you are on your way. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me, please? My Father, I thank you for this um, very honest story out of David's life. I can't imagine what he must have felt when he saw a man doing what he was, what was, appeared to be good, but to be struck down for it. But Father, that started a cascade of discovery in David's life, and he realized that you are concerned with the little things as much as the big things. I pray that that message, that lesson, that principle would translate over into our lives as well. Father, teach us what little details look like that are important to you. And I pray that you would give us the grace and the courage to follow them so that we can find freedom in our life. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for coming. Our prayer team's going to be here uh, 